according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the Scriptures. Join me in Genesis 1.1. Okay, not Genesis 1.1, but chapter 1. We are uh, approaching day 6 today. Almost wrapped up everything in day 5 last week. So much that we need to deal with here in a book that uh, is foundational to everything that follows. Realizing that we uh, are all Adamic. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. That's our human birth. Our physical birth is in Adam. But our spiritual birth is in Christ. And the foundation for this starts here. And if we reject Genesis, we're not saved. If we reject the theology of Genesis, how would we expect the last Adam to redeem us? from our lost estate in the first Adam. Understand, this is, uh, I think, why Satan hates it so much, why he rejects it so much, why the criticism comes the way that it does, as they reject creation, they reject uh, so much of what Genesis portrays. The role of men and women, male and female, he created them. You get that? We're going to be looking at that. That's the nature of humanity. Male and female, he created them. And uh, the significance of that, the theological significance of that, we cannot lose track, and yet our generation has. And our culture is completely off the rails when it comes to these things. So I'm thankful the Lord has brought us to Genesis. We're going to see how far we get with it. I intend to teach it uh, for the rest of this year and all of next year. And then we're going to put it on hold because of our Through the Bible plan for, uh, for 2022. So rapture pending, uh, we're going to do a Through the Bible year, and uh, and then... We'll resume Genesis after that. So anyway, that's my, uh, that's my long-term plan, rapture painting. I'd rather just hear a trumpet and go to glory. So we'll, uh, we'll see what the Lord has in mind. Before we get started, though, let's take a moment for silent prayer, call upon our Father and His faithfulness to bless our time of study. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we do come before You this morning thankful for grace and truth rejoicing in the grace that saved us, and so thankful, Father, that the truth keeps us grounded, that uh, we abide in your word, we will know the truth, the truth sets us free. Father, I thank you for a body of brothers and sisters that makes the word of God their number one priority. I thank you that we can study to show ourselves approved. I thank you that we can sing these hymns of praise with the, uh, the word of Christ richly dwelling within us. All these things that we're studying today, we're pleased to live them out for the glory of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, and so as we've been working our way through these days, and I think that we, um, yeah, I think we pretty much wrapped up the last of day five last week. Um, might have run slightly out of time as I was taking us through the blessing, so let's just pick up there. Day five echoes the day two activity. When you work your way through the six days, you don't get to day seven until chapter two. When you work your way through the six days, one, two, and three are parallel by four, five, and six. That there's echoes of one, two, and three that, that are expressed in four, five, and six. Day one, for example, was let there be light. Day four is let there be lights, plural. And the sun, moon, and stars that are, that are ordered to start providing for the light governance upon planet Earth. That's the, the parallel between day one and day four. We have more parallel between day two and day five. Because in day two, the waters above are separated from the waters below. And we have the establishment of the atmosphere, what's sometimes called the firmament in the, in the King James Bible. But the, uh, the firmament is established, whereby the waters above the firmament are uh, distinguished from the waters below the firmament. So on day two, we have air and water. And those are the realms that are populated on day five. On day five, we have the air and water realms that are populated with the fish and the birds. We also have a single then God said statement, unlike day three where there's two then God saids, and day six where there are two then God saids. On day five, there's only one then God said, but he said two things. Okay, he had a twin uh, imperative. 
on the single then God said statement. In Genesis 1.20, then God said, let the waters teem, let the waters swarm. Genesis 1.20, God said, let the waters swarm with a swarm, a living soul. And this is the introduction of a living soul, chaya for life and nefesh for soul. That fish and birds and animals and people, we all have souls. We're, we all are souls in this sense because we are living. We don't stay put. A plant stays put. A rock stays put. The inanimate creation doesn't move because that's inanimate. The, the moving of the living creatures, the birds, the fish, the animals, and man, it is our uh, living soul reality in this creation. And so the first mention of a living soul is when the, when the waters are commanded to swarm. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Now the waters aren't intelligent. The waters can't produce anything. But when God makes the uh, dragons and every living soul that moves with which the waters swarm after their kind and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. And so this is material we looked at last week. Remember on day three when God said, let the earth vegetate vegetation, the earth did so. The earth vegetated vegetation. God activated the earth's vegetative nature that uh, was built in to the earth itself. That the soil, the ground, the dirt, the minerals, the, the life that is contained within the earth uh, was activated so as for the vegetation to vegetate. And the seeds that had been in the earth already, the seeds were there. They started to vegetate upon God's order for the earth to, uh, to vegetate. So on day three, the earth vegetated as ordered, but on day five, the waters could not swarm until God bara created. And this is the first bara usage we've seen since verse one. The fish were a divine creation. God bara the fish and they appeared. This is the first bara creation, ex nihilo creation since day one. Also the birds, but we learn in chapter two, the birds are formed out of dirt the way that the land animals are formed out of the dirt. We'll get to that when we get to Genesis 2.19. The first created sea animal is the dragon. And if you missed it last week, I would encourage you to either go watch the YouTube video or listen to the MP3 that's sitting there on the website minding its own MP3 business. And you can uh, realize that the bulk of our hour last week was spent talking about dragons, the tanin, and the fact that Satan was a dragon before there were any zoological dragons in the ocean. But the, uh, the, the dragon was designed to sport in the sea. And... Um, we uh, took time to look at many of these tannin usages on the dragon. Fish and birds are created with different kinds of flesh, yet both with in-kind procreative function. It is a curious thing to me in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 36 through 39, related to how our bodies are constituated and how our bodies are resurrected. But he says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fish. And this seems to be taking the Genesis account literally, which is good, we all do, but, but recognizing that the bird realm is not the fish realm, and neither the bird realm nor the fish realm are the animal realm, and none of those realms are the human realm. And this is uh, to keep things biblical. We're not going to be uh, atheistic, unbiblical, uh, in our biology departments, all right? And we're not going to put humanity on the tree of life as if we're part of the food chain, as if we're part of what evolved uh, from a monkey or from goo or something else, all right? That the fish realm is different from the bird realm, and that's by design. Same thing with the animal realm. The, the, the land animals didn't come crawling out of the sea and evolving uh, and losing our flippers and our fins. Uh, that's, that's not how God operated, okay? God was not Darwinian. This is the real story here as God revealed it to Moses. So uh, the different kinds of flesh, and yet each is going to procreate after its kind. And so the, uh, the term kind, I hope you're not tired of hearing it, we, uh, we're going to come across kind again and again and again and again. It saturates chapter 1. The Hebrew noun is mean, M-I-Y-N, mean. And every time in chapter 1 we have these mean statements, 
it, it's telling us that these animals are procreating after their kind, or the plants are vegetating after their kind. And so every fish, every bird, there's no bird, you know, you got a hamster in a cage and your hamster has babies. You know what those babies are going to be? Baby hamsters. They're not going to be baby fish. They're not going to be baby birds. There's not going to be a dog that ever decided to have kittens or a cat that ever had puppies. That's not how God designed it. And this is what we deal with. And this is, by the way, the blessing in Adam and Eve as body, soul, and spirit to procreate body, soul, and spirit. The traducian understanding of the origin of soul and spirit in uh, the human realm. We'll talk about that here today. But this is where we ran out of time in recognizing that something new happens here on day five, and this is the blessing. There were a lot of things that God saw were good on day one, and they were good on day three. There was no good statement on day two. There was a good statement on day three and on day four. On day five, God saw that it was good. But then we're told that God blessed them. God blessed them saying. And now God has creatures that he relates to, creatures that he communicates with, creatures that he talks to. And these days they don't talk back, but I'm curious as to whether they did in originally before the fall. Uh, the serpent talked and that wasn't a, a freak out for Adam and Eve. And I'm curious too, other than Balaam's donkey, there's not a lot of talking animals in the Bible. But God does communicate them and he, and he communicates with them as he blesses them. Blessings are always verbal. And so here's the blessing here. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. This is the first divine blessing. And it comes to the fish and the birds with fruitful multiplication imperative. And it's the third dominant B word that we have in Genesis. We have bereshith for in the beginning, bara for created, and then barak for blessing. Barak is the verb to bless. Barakah is the noun for blessing. And we're going to see blessing again when he creates Adam and Eve, that God is going to bless them and he's going to put them to work. These are going to have restrictions. They're going to have rules. The animals don't, aren't given rules and the animals don't have moral agency and the animals, uh, they're going to be serving man to accomplish what man needs done, but they're not morally accountable for what God expects to be done. There'll be other things I guess we can talk about when it comes to the animals, we never find an animal ever defying the will of God. There's never an animal that disobeys. When he wants a donkey to speak, a donkey speaks. When he wants a, a, a great fish to swallow Jonah, that's what happens. Every time God order, you know, orders two bears to, to end uh, a gang problem, uh, the two bears uh, go in and they, they deal with the unruly youths of, uh, of that day. I'm sure it was a mostly peaceful protest, but the bears took care of it, all right? Anytime God orders the animals to do something, they do it. There's no such thing as an animal sin or animal rebellion against what God wants the animal to do. Unlike angels and humans, we are the moral realm of God's co created cosmos. Angels have the volitional capacity to rebel, and one third of them did. And uh, humans, of course, have the capacity to rebel, and we do it all the time. So um, that's what we're dealing with there. We'll have more to say, I think, on animals moving forward. Adam's going to name the animals. He's going to be looking for a partner, and he doesn't find a partner in the animals. He has dominion over the animals. And uh, these are principles, too, that we have to be clear on. Well, let's start looking at day six then, and which makes up, look how many verses we have here, from verse 24 down to verse 31. It is the most detail of any of the days in this chapter. Day six is an echo of day three. There are two let there be statements, or two declarative statements that are made, two separate declarative creative works. Remember what he did on day three was he separated out the dry land from the water. Dry land appeared on day three. So now on day six he's going to populate dry land. He's going to create the animals from the dry land and he's going to put man on the dry land. We, uh, we're not designed to be aquatic. <laughs> so uh, here we are. Interesting. I mean, when, when you want to Go look underwater. You need equipment to do that because we don't have the gills and the equipment that God gave the fish. So God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. And similar to the command with let the earth vegetate vegetation or let the waters swarm swarms, he says, let the earth bring forth. 
And the earth is not able to produce animals the way that the animal, the way that the earth could vegetate the vegetation. So again, God is going to have to do the creative work. Let the earth bring forth creative, uh, creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. We have three divisions of land animals here, just as we had three classifications of vegetation. We had shrubs, we had trees, we had, uh, there were three breakdowns of the, on the vegetation. There are three breakdowns on the animal realm. And uh, the, the, the term that's translated cattle speaks of domesticated animals. The term that speaks of beasts of the earth would be your wild animals. And then the creeping things is everything else. The creeps, the crawling, the insects, the, the, um, the amphibians, the, the serpents, the, uh, everything else. All right? This is not a science textbook. This is not breaking down the animal realm like the unbelievers would do with, uh, with family, kingdom family, uh, genus, species, and all of that. This just has three divisions of plant life, three divisions of animal life, and that's how God presented it. But each kind is replicating after its kind. And we do have the mean statements again and again. And again, the Hebrew term mean is the kind that they replicate after. So uh, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beast of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. Now again, it's the three, it's a different order, but it's the three same divisions of animal kind. And God had to make them, and he does so here, and he makes them in, a, in the same way that he makes Adam and Eve. He forms dirt, but we're not going to learn that until chapter 2. And he's going to shape them. And uh, in so doing, he makes them with the verb nasa, and he creates them with the verb bara. All right. And God saw that it was good. There's no blessing that's stated there for the animals, but I think they fall under the blessing that was previously given. That's... Uh, it takes more work. All right, verse 26. I, I think the animal blessing falls under the bird and fish blessing. In any event, we get to verse 26 and we have the real pinnacle of this day, which is the pinnacle of the week. God said, let us, let us make man in our image. This is a huge change. Everything up till now has been let there be, let something be done, let something happen. He's talked in the third person. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let the earth do this. Let the water do that. Everything up till now has been in the third person until he gets to humanity. His second let there statement is not let there be, it's let us. Let us make. This final command is given in its uh, cohortative imperative in the Hebrew. It's a first person plural it's what the, the triune Godhead wants to do last of all. With everything else done, everything else is prepared. The table is set. We're ready now for God's image to walk this earth in human flesh. And it's going to walk this earth in human flesh through, through the first Adam, all right? And we'll talk about this as well. So let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so everything created on day four and day five belongs to, or I'm sorry, day five and day six. Everything created from the birds to the fish to the animals, it's all man's, under man's sovereignty. So let us make and let them rule. Let us make and let them rule. So God, bara, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he, bara, created him. Male and female, he, bara, created them. And so we have a triple bara right there in that one verse. <laughs> and it just resounds. So the book began with that, Bereshith bara, in the beginning God created. But we've now come through six days of, of detail to bring us to this moment. And it's not spoken in the third person, it's spoken in the first person. Here's what we're fixing to do, and then God did it. 
God created, God created, God created. <clears throat> God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And let me tell you, we could preach this for a month. We could preach this for a year because our culture is so lost on the male and female, he created them. And um, they spend half their time saying, no, there's no difference. And uh, then they, they try to tell you that there's really 60 genders or more and there's all these other things going on. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we're going to keep it biblical here today. Male and female, he created them. When we get to chapter 2, we're going to see the purpose here is for marriage. The purpose here is for each generation to accomplish the imaging imperative and to train up the next generation so they can accomplish the imaging imperative. And then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule. So similar to the animal blessing in the fruitfulness and the multiplying, but then comes the ruling. And this is what the animals can't do, what we must do. We don't worship the creation, we, they serve us. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Every living soul that moves on the earth. And we'll talk about the diet, vegetarian until the flood. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth. Every tree which has fruit yielding seed shall be food for you. This takes us back to the, the, uh, the vegetation day. And this was the food, food for humanity and food for the animals. He doesn't instruct the animals, though. He instructs Adam and Eve. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And he saw all that he had made. Behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. All right, so there's our detail. And here's what we've got to break down for us today. Starting with the animals. God commanded the earth to bring forth living creatures after their kind. He ordered the earth to bring forth, similar to how he ordered the waters to swarm. The earth could not obey it, the waters could not obey it, and God himself does what he wants done. The waters were incapable of swarming, the earth was incapable of producing animals. So God did it, but he took from the earth to do so. And uh, we've already read Genesis 1.25. we got more detail on this that we're going to get in Genesis 2.19. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. So the birds and the animals have this dirt origin, just like we do. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What happens when the, uh, the animal dies? What happens to its body? Same thing that happens to our body. It's going to return to the dirt because that's where it came from. That's detail we're going to get in chapter 2. So just as the waters were incapable of swarming, the earth was incapable of producing animals. So God created... God created three categories of land animals, all with in-kind procreative function. God created three categories of land animals. The beast, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the cattle, it's called cattle. Um, and, and sadly, we're stuck because we're in Texas and cattle means one thing in Texas. All right. But cattle in, in the Hebrew Bible is, uh, is, is reference to any domesticated. So it includes sheep and goats. It would include... Uh, anything that, that humans keep and breed and, and, uh, and uh, produce and all that. So uh, cattle is, is, if you want to just use domesticated uh, animal life, that would be a fine translation of, uh, of the Hebrew expression here. And then the crawling, the creeping things, and then the, uh, the beasts of the earth, and that is they roam the earth. You, they're not pets, they're not domesticated, you don't, have, uh, you don't have a grizzly bear ranch, okay? Uh, you don't hook up a, a plow to the, to the leopard, all right? So the wild beasts, 
are the ones that are not domesticated nor domesticatable, even though we keep trying with some degree of success. In fact, there are some that claim that they can domesticate the undomesticatable. And yet it's curious how quickly they revert back to the, uh, to the uh, um, wild state that is their nature. And the offspring, even raised in captivity, still has the wild nature that God has vested into. They're called creatures of instinct, born to be killed is their purpose. And um, it's not sad when one of them dies. They were born to be killed. And if uh, we don't do it, another animal will do it. And that's, uh, that's the biblical reality of what we have there. Again, all with in-kind procreative function. God's not going to spend week after week after week repopulating the earth with all these animals. He did it once in this creation week, and then those fish, birds, and animals are going to reproduce themselves. That's what they're designed to do. That's why Noah had to preserve them in the ark, because after the flood, God wasn't going to go back to create a new batch. That this is his creation in, in this week. On day seven, he's going to rest, and he's not going to create again until the church age, when he creates the royal family of God, when he creates the, the heavenly people that you and I are in Christ. That is the new creation, but that, that's not until the church age. The three categories of land animals. For the pinnacle of this creation account, let there be is changed to let us. Let there be is uh, changed to let us. And if you're a Hebrew grammarian, then you know what is meant by the jusif. You know what is meant by the cohortative. You've got different verbs and different verb stems and different ways that these uh, commands are given. But a jusif is essentially what we have seen in Colossians, actually. It's a third person imperative. It's let there be or let let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, or let the peace of Christ uh, rule your hearts. Um, it's, it's let something be done. Let there be. And it's, it's talking in the third person about something that, that is being ordered to happen. And when God says it, it happens, because God is the I am. God is the pure existent one. He is the only being that, that requires no uh, contingent statement to exist. Everything else that exists, exists because the I am said, let there be. And these are, these are the absolute glories of, of creation as we understand it. But for this final work, this final work, which he does in stages, by the way, we don't learn that until chapter 2, uh, when he creates Adam, uh, Eve is, is built in, all right? She's included, he just didn't know it yet, all right? But when, uh, when he created man, Adam, he created Adam, male and female. He created them. And Adam is not assigned to rule. They are assigned to rule. God doesn't say let him rule and let her help him. He says let them rule. But he can't rule by himself. He does need the helper. And this is uh, so that with her help, they can rule. And that's the, the, uh, the essence of this text. So it changes to a let us. And it's spotlighting the specific work that God himself is doing. Now we've seen it already. God himself made the fish and the birds and the animals. God himself took upon himself to do what the water couldn't do, what the land couldn't do. God did it, but God didn't order himself to do it. Like, unlike with man. God orders himself to do it. God says, let us make. And so you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect agreement, and the plan is executed according to the Father's design, the Son, and the Holy Spirit's agreement. And the Son, actually, I believe, is the agent of Trinity who does all this anyway. But it's ordered by the Godhead, and God does it. So, let us. And we're told that He does. He does, and it's stated three times, bara, bara, bara. Father, Son, Spirit, maybe. Some commentaries take it that way, but, you know, the, the let us, some, you, can, you can read Trinity into that. You know, we do a lot, we read a lot into this because of what we know with hindsight, what we know with the New Testament, that uh, because we, we are Trinitarian, we do recognize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is very easy to look back to the let us 
and say, oh, that's Trinity talking. And uh, our image, that's Trinity talking. Uh, we, we, can, we can see that. The passage is consistent with that. The passage doesn't demand that. But uh, I don't have any issue with, with seeing it here in, uh, in that regard. being made in the image, salam, the image, according to the demuth likeness. Remember I told you, you're going to get about 20 Hebrew words in the process of this uh, Genesis study. And even if you have no interest in learning Hebrew, you should at least learn bara, you should at least for create, and should at least learn lasa for make. And we're going to get a, a handful more here on day six. But the tselem is the image and the demuth is the likeness. And they're usually in this order, but sometimes they're reversed. And uh, when Adam begins to procreate, we're going to find a statement. In fact, we can look at that now. A statement where Adam begins to procreate. But the order in verse 26 is image and likeness. The Tzalem and the Demuth. Let us make man in our Tzalem, image, according to our Demuth likeness. In and according to. These are going to be functions that are going to be important for us to see, especially once it dawns on us that imaging is verbal. Beyond the fact that it's a, an adjectival description, it's actually verbal, where we are expected to image God. And we image when we rule. When we are His representative rulers over creation, we're imaging Him. When we rule the animal, we're imaging Him. Image and likeness. In Genesis 5, they start having their children, well, after Cain and Abel. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day when God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. So there's bara and asa in the same verse. Creation by the will of God, and then, of course, the making, the molding, the fashioning, the, the dust body that breathes, and or God breathes the breath of life into him. Both are true. If we're going to have a fight over bara and asa, let's at least have a fight on God's terms and not our own. He created the male and female. He blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. So whether they were male or female, they're both named Adam. They're both Adam. They're both man or mankind, if you insist on that. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son and this is where the order gets reversed. He becomes the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then not only is the order reversed, but the prepositions likewise, because the in is connected to demuth, likeness, and the according to is connected to tselem, image. And so we're going to relax about the prepositions, whether it's in or according to, because they can be interchangeable. And this proves that they can be interchangeable. And the order, image doesn't have to come first, likeness can come first. Because they're both true, they're both in tandem. Image and likeness are not synonyms, but they are related and they are uh, connected. He becomes a father of a son in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. By the way, this is after, obviously, Cain and Abel, and Cain murders Abel, and we have the whole circumstances of the fall, and everything that's happened in between. Seth is the replacement for the son that they lost. And uh, we're going to talk about that, and how many other sons did they have? How many other daughters did they have? Well, we're told right here. The days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. How many sons and daughters do you have when you live 800 years? you know, plus 130. You have 930 years. How many sons and daughters are you going to have over that time? You know, these days when we, when we live 70 or 80 or 90 years or whatever, and our, the childbearing years for, for women are in a, in a window there, all right, it's not hundreds and hundreds of years. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. All right. Back to Genesis 1.26, because we have the image and the likeness. And I tell you, when you read 100 commentaries on Genesis, you get 100 opinions on image and likeness. Uh, maybe not that many, because usually they steal from each other. And uh, they like to find a, a trinity. They like to find uh, you know, body, soul, and spirit. 
uh, matches the Trinity of God with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they, they say, you know, we've got a visible side and an invisible side. They've got, or maybe intellect, sensibility, and will. That's one of my favorites because uh, I got that from Schaefer. And uh, all of these ideas about the image of God, none of them come from this text. None of them come from any text. They're all considerations based upon theological conclusions. And while I agree we are body, soul, and human spirit, uh, I'm, I'm not willing to say that that's what defines the image of God. All right? And I think we can do better than that. And I think we can stay biblical as we do better than that. Or that we have intellect, sensibility, and will. We do have intellect, sensibility, and will. But am I willing to say that's the image of God when this verse doesn't tell us that's the image of God? We have other passages that talk about the image of God. Why don't we use those? Maybe those passages will give us our definition. You see what I'm saying? We did this a couple weeks ago when we did a study in the book of Daniel, and instead of trying to be all creative and sell books and be sensational about the book of Daniel, and what do you think the head of gold is? What do you think the chest of silver is? What do you think the, the, the legs of iron are? And all these things. Instead of just making it up ourselves with something that sounds good, why don't we just read what the text says? The text says Babylon is the head of gold and Persia is the chest of silver. And we'll just take it from there. We're going to do the same thing with the image of God. Because the Bible says a lot about the image of God. In addition to Adam being created in the image of God, we have more information than that that's given to us. I'm going to spell that out for you here presently. Being made in the image according to the likeness. And Adam kind is given rulership over every other living kind. Every other living kind. So we don't worship the animals. We don't serve the animals. We don't build idols to the animals. They serve us. They work for us. This is their purpose. This is their design. And if we want to violate God's design in any of these things, we can pervert God's design. We can pervert God's design for marriage, for family, for animal life. And those perversions, God calls them abominations. So stay tuned. Adam's creation in the image of God. Oh my goodness, that wasn't supposed to happen. How did that happen? <laughs> I have a broken slideshow. All right. We're going to go old school today. Off, off track. I thought I had fixed that already. All right, we'll just take it from there. Adam's creation in the image of God is a prime consideration against idolatry. Let's start with that. Because if you set up an image and you pray to an image, not only is that a false image because it's not the one true God, but it misses the point that you are created in the image of the one true God. So understand there is more at work with idolatry than we typically will understand. In Daniel chapter 2, we have examples where Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image. First of all, he has a dream about an image, and then he sets up an image. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. Now this is Aramaic rather than Hebrew, but it's, it's the cognate vocabulary, and it's the concept of the image. There was a single great statue, and that statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This is a calendar for Gentile dominion over the Jewish people. And we're, we're there. We're in the feet right now. The year 2020 A.D., we're in the iron and clay feet right now. And we're waiting for toes any day now. Any day now, these toes are going to pop out of those feet. Any day now, the horns are going to appear on a beast. And a revived Roman Empire is going to, uh, is going to enter onto the world stage of Gentile history 
abusing the Jewish people. But this is the image, all right? There's a lot of doctrine here. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into it. I did a couple weeks ago. We took a Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening, to do a, a brief refresher course on eschatology so that we don't get all panicky because of politics or headlines in the news or we don't submit to uh, newspaper exegesis. We can understand that God controls history uh, no matter what happens between now and January the 20th, all right? And uh, whichever president is inaugurated on that day, God is in charge. And those toes are going to come popping out. And in the days of those kings, Jesus Christ is coming back. How close are we? Anyway, Daniel 2 is a, is a marvelous uh, refresher on eschatological events. How about Daniel 3? Nebuchadnezzar was made king. Oh, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image. Now again, it's not Hebrew because this part of Daniel was written in Aramaic, but it's, it's the vocabulary that we're looking at as we look at the image and likeness of God. When we understand you set up an image, you might set up a, brazen, a bronze image, you might set up a golden image, you might set up a, a, a wooden image. Uh, there's all kinds of idolatry, but they're images that you pray to, that you look at, that you get impressed with. And the more you spend, the, the better craftsmen you hire, the, uh, the more impressive your image can be. But it's still something you did, not something God did, and that makes it idolatry. And idolatry is insane when we already are created in the image of God. And uh, there's an issue there that we want to we want to stress. So Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits, and set it up on the plain of Dur in the province of Babylon. So it's 90 cubits, or uh, 60 cubits high. Huge statue, huge golden statue. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the rulers of the provinces to come to dedicate to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. This, by the way, would include the conquered Jewish people. And uh, Manasseh, I think, or one of the kings actually traveled there from Jerusalem to uh, take part in this, or Hezekiah, somebody did. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, the rulers of the province were assembled together. I love those redundant, detailed passages. Don't you love those? Okay? Because we're commanded to be subject to the governing authorities that are over us. And that includes every level. That includes executive, legislative, judicial. That includes federal, state, local. That includes uh, every classification and division. And you can't, uh, it's weasel words when you get around to say, well, well, I'm supposed to honor the king, but we don't have a king. We have a president, so I'm off the hook. Wait a minute. Take a look at all the variety of terms here. And quit being a Pharisee with vocabulary. So the heralds uh, proclaim loudly, to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. Peoples, nations, and languages. Stay tuned. Genesis gives us the foundation for peoples, nations, and languages. What it is that he's designed since Babel for all of humanity to, to function around this world. Peoples, nations, and languages. So at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music. Again, there's a variety there, like psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Nebuchadnezzar had a great music program. Okay, Most cults do. False religion can do real well with this. You ever heard the Mormon Tabernacle Choir? It sounds amazing. The religion, of course, is satanic from the pit of hell, but the music, wow. Okay, here's Nebuchadnezzar's music program. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Well, guess what? We're not to worship. That commandment number one is you shall have no other gods before me. And commandment number two is don't make any images in keeping with commandment number one. <laughs> okay, so when you're studying the Ten Commandments, it's amazing how one and two are just linked together like that. Not worshiping another god, because they're phonies anyway, and not setting up an image. We're the image. We are created in the image, and now that we're saved, we're being renewed into the new image, the image of Jesus Christ. 
We bore the first image, now we're going to bear the second. All right, now let's look at Colossians 1.15. And I'm so thankful that God had us hold off on the Genesis series until we taught Colossians, until we taught Hebrews, until we taught Proverbs 8, until we taught the different um, passages of Christology that we've been learning over the last five years, six years. We've been getting into some pretty deep Christology. Some, um, I think, groundbreaking stuff on the hypostatic union, on the incarnation, on the nature of, of uh, God the Son and in, in His uh, deity and in His humanity. Uh, things that um, really go back to uh, Arius and Athanasius and the Arian controversy whereby he was condemned as a heretic because he said that God the Son was a created being. God the Son is not a created being. He is God the Son, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity has always been Trinity. But something was birthed on day one, and this is what we want to understand. And this is what we've come to understand by putting these passages all together. Jesus Christ is the image of God. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of God, the firstborn of all creation. Remember this? This is a praise. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We all can recognize this. We all confess this. If you're a believer, if you're saved, this is talking about you. This is talking about all of us. We've all been made alive. We've all been transferred into Jesus' kingdom in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, what else about Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. You see the difference? Adam was created in the image, but Jesus is the image. If you never thought about that, write it down and spend the next week thinking about it. Adam was created in the image of God. It's not fair to say Adam was the image of God, but he was created in the image of God according to the likeness. He was uh, commanded to image God in his reigning. But there's a big difference now. Jesus is the image of God. He is. That's the nature of who he is by virtue of what God did to bring this about, to birth the humanity of our Savior, to birth the incarnation, to birth the hypostatic union, and to vest the human nature onto the person of God the Son. So He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. And we've done so many firstborn studies, we're going to do more. We're going to see the firstborn. The firstborn has a special sacrifice. The firstborn has to be redeemed of animals, birds, men, the firstborn has to be redeemed. The firstborn son has to be redeemed. Sorry, girls. Okay? The firstborn son has to be redeemed. So stay tuned for that. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. There's not just one verse by itself that tells us this. We talk about what Satan does and confusing things so unbelievers don't get saved. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Jesus Christ is the image of God. When you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father because He's the image of God. And when you come to Christ, when you see Christ, you're seeing the image of God. And this is uh, what Satan blinds when he's obscuring things related to the gospel. He blinds the minds of the unbelieving. By the way, is Satan is, you, but this is proof Satan is not a Calvinist. Because Satan believes that the unbeliever can believe. So he blinds their eyes so that they can't see and believe. But the God of this world blinds the minds of the unbelieving. He is the image of God. How about Hebrews 1.3? Remember this? I spent three years teaching Hebrews. 
This is the image of God principle, but it uses light language. It uses the light metaphor. He is the radiance of His glory. The radiance of His glory. So if you think about anything that produces light, you have the thing that produces the light, or that is light, and then you have the radiance. You have the beams that shine forth. You have the expression of that light that travels somewhere and is observed by somebody when he gets there. Like the sunlight that reaches us, or the moonlight, or the sun starlight. When the light reaches us, we observe it. So Jesus, the Father didn't come to earth. It was the Son who came to earth. God the Son became flesh. God the Son was born of a virgin. God the Son was the baby in the manger. And He, was, he came to this earth because He already was the God-man. He already had been begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, the exact representation of His nature. and upholds all things by the word of His power. So Jesus Christ is the image of God. Adam in the, was created in the image, but Jesus is the image. And I think when we combine those two thoughts, what do we end up with? Adam was created in the image of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. Does that become significant? Does that then begin to relate with anything else that we understand with respect to the Father's desire for a son and for that son to have brethren. I hope it does. Adam's creation in his image provides Adam's basis for sonship. He's called the Son of God in Luke 3, 38, which is a little bit strange since he's not procreated, he's created. You know, dust breathing. There was no procreation that brought about Adam. He did not have a belly button. All right. So, the, uh, but he's called the Son of God. You read through these, and uh, you might even memorize these. My son memorized these once upon a time. Could name 60 generations from Adam to Jesus based upon the genealogical records. But when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. He was supposed the son of Joseph, but we know that Joseph was not involved in the procreation. Mary was a virgin. Joseph was not the, 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 the biological dad. He did not contribute chromosomes. Where did those other 23 chromosomes come from? All right. As supposed, the son of Joseph, son of Eli, son of Matt, that son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of David. But notice it's the son of Nathan, not Solomon, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed. Going back, you're going to get to uh, Judah, because he's of both tribe of Judah. You're going to get to Abraham, Noah. We all have the same family tree from Noah on back the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. That's the replacement. That's the son that was appointed. The name Seth means appointed. The name Seth means appointed. Appointed to carry the seed of the woman promise for the, the redemption of Adamic humanity. The son of Adam, the son of God. Why is he called the son of God? He's not birthed by God. He is called the Son of God. There is a father-son relationship between God and Adam. Why is there a father-son relationship between God and Adam? It's because there's a father-son relationship between God the Father and God the Son. God the Son is the begotten Son of God. And He is the creator of everything. I want to stress this again. He is the creator of everything. If my slideshow is broken, let me uh, just remind you of this. In uh, Proverbs 8, starting in verse 22, we have Jesus' we have the, the birthday of the Son of God. We have not his deity, 
But the birthing of his human nature, the birthing of his human nature, okay? I want to I want to key on this. How much time do we have? We have the word became flesh. Let's see. Yeah, I'll fix my slideshow for next week because then we're going to come back to the bara statements. We're going to come back to the male and female statements. All right. There's a birth here in, in Proverbs chapter. I'm going to give you the fast version, the short version on this, all right? Because there's a birth. And this is what Arius and Athanasius were fighting about. This is what leads to the Nicene Creed, and the Nicene Council in the third century. Because a birth is taking place. The Lord begat me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I know it says possessed, but he acquired, he obtained, he possessed, he begat. At the beginning of his way before his works of old. From everlasting I was woven, like the baby who's woven in the womb. From beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, I was birthed. When there were no depths, I was birthed. So we know that this event precedes Genesis 1-2 because the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the depths, the tohom. This is before the tohu wabohu. This is before anything. When there were no depths, I was birthed. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. He was birthed before the angelic conflict. The mountains and hills are the... Uh, seats of the angelic rulers. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world. Look at that. There's no dust yet. Where did Adam come from? Came from the dust. The Proverbs 8 is showing us a birth that's pre-Adam, pre-angels, pre-earth. It's not just in the beginning, it's from the beginning. From the beginning. This is the boundary of eternity past and time. This is the alpha moment that begins the progression of time. I was there. And I was there as a workman. I was there as a master carpenter. I was beside him as a master workman. I was daily his delight, playing, rejoicing always before him. This is a father who loves his son and a son that's doing everything the father wants him to do. Rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. All right, so there's more on that. If you need uh, direction, I can point you the right way. We've got MP3s that deal with Proverbs 8. So here's a question. What was it that was birthed before the dust? What was it that was birthed before the deep? What was birthed before there was anything else created? Because this is not a Bethlehem manger. This is not the body of our Savior. This is not His body. His body doesn't come for thousands of years. His body doesn't come until a virgin is pregnant. But what comes before His body? This is, this is like mind-blowing once the light bulb comes on and you realize, wait a minute. Does He need a body in order to have a human spirit? Does he need a body to become the God-man? And if the Father begets his human spirit and begets that human spirit and bestows it upon God the Son, then you understand that God the Son accepts that birth, accepts that, that human spirit being begotten of the Father. And from that moment on, God the Son becomes the God-man. Hypostatic union begins at this alpha moment. Are you following this? Because it's much more normal to say, no, no, hypostatic union doesn't come until a pregnant virgin has a baby. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Then he has a body. When he has a body, that's what gives him, his body is what gives him his human soul and his human spirit. Says who? Do you need a body to have a human spirit? <laughs> My mom left her body eight years ago and she still has her human spirit. The, spirit, the soul spirit of humanity is not body dependent. All right. And all of these things, I want to stress, all of these things are going to come back now to Genesis chapter 1. Because in procreating after their kind, Adam and Eve birthed 
Cain and Abel and Seth and all their other sons and daughters. Those sons and daughters bore the image and likeness of Adam who was created in the image and likeness of God. This is because we procreate after our kind. And human begets human. Right? Shouldn't be complicated. I watched my wife four times and all four times she birthed a human being. And I'm thankful I don't have to do that. That that looks painful. Okay? But all four times it was a human being that was born and it was born, all four of them were born body, soul, dead human spirit. Because of course our curse in Adam. Procreation is not just physical. Procreation is spiritual. Procreation is the two become one flesh, but it is the two body, soul, and spirit that become one flesh. And in the birthing of the next generation, it is body, soul, and spirit. By the way, it's called the Traducian view of the origin of human souls. So stay tuned. More on that. Back to Genesis. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, plural, let them rule. Because it's not going to take long. It starts with Adam and Eve, but then there's going to be children, then there's going to be grandchildren, then there's going to be, I mean, generations come. And as the generations proceed, you end up with uh, families that turn into clans and clans that turn into peoples and peoples that form nations. This also is part of God's design. This also is featured in Genesis. And uh, peoples that speak their nations, that speak their languages in uh, the boundaries that God establishes. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And my broken slideshow is not going to let me show you the uh, vocabulary here, so we're going to come back to this next week. But Adam... Is, uh, is man, it's also dirt, it's also red, it's also uh, an expression for a lot of things. And man and woman together are both called Adam, they're both called man. Male and female, by the way, is not man and woman. We're going to learn when he gets his rib back, and his rib is improved because it was a rib he couldn't see, now it's, uh, it's a naked woman he can see, and this things are getting better. The the uh, when he gets his rib back, it's ish and isha, which is not male and female, zaker and nikkava, okay, zaker and nikkava, and uh, I apologize that my slideshow is broken. We'll, uh, we'll we'll come back and we'll look at these male and female is zaker and nikkava. Man and woman is Ish and Isha. And there's principles that are at work when a generation departs from father and mother and cleaves to one another. When an Ish and an Isha become husband and wife. And it's curious, most Hebrew, Greek, these languages don't often distinguish between man and woman, husband and wife. They're the same words. We're going to talk about these things because this is what God designed. So stay tuned. All right. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you. I thank you for the, the broken slideshow. That's what you wanted. But um, we'll come back again. Lord willing, rapture pending. We're going to be clear, Father, on why does a son leave his parents? Why does a, a daughter leave her parents? When, um, when do they uh, assume their own generational accountability before you? in the Adamic design to image God and to rule. Father, I pray that uh, we can be biblical in these things and not worldly. The cosmos wisdom is, is pretty awful. In, uh, it's foolishness in your sight. But Father, uh, we want to be as biblical as we can in all that is said and done. So we thank you and we praise you, Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we will close with our hymn of the month. We get a new one next week.